I can't think of a character in literature that made my blood boil more than Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> Rowling actually got inspiration for her character from an instructor that she had in her youth and said that she disliked her intensely on sight. She drew inspiration for her name with Dolores meaning sorrow, something that she inflicts on all those around her. And Umbridge is a play on the word Umbridge, meaning offense, because she's offended by any challenge of her limited worldview. JK released a lot of information about Umbridge's character past the books. In this video, I'm going to gather all of the information that we have on her, as I explain the entire life of Dolores Umbridge. This will not be based on the films, but the original source material and the new material that Rowling has released more recently. Let's get started. Dolores Jane Umbridge was born to Orford Umbridge, a wizard, and Ellen Cracknell, who surprisingly was a muggle. Umbridge had a younger brother who was a squib, meaning that he was born into a magical family but had no magical ability himself. Umbridge's parents were unhappily married, and Dolores secretly despised them both. She despised her father for his lack of ambition. He worked in the Department of Magical Maintenance in the Ministry of Magic, essentially as a janitor, and had never once been promoted. She despised her mother for many reasons, but most of all because she was a muggle. Dolores and her father both blamed her mother for her squib brother, which caused a lot of tension. So much tension, in fact, that the family split down the middle, Dolores going with her wizard father, and her brother going with her muggle mother. The two vanished into the muggle world, while Dolores and her father continued their life in the wizarding world. Dolores would never see her mother or her brother again, and she pretended that they never existed. She thought that they would tarnish her reputation, so from then on, she never spoke of them, and henceforth, she told anyone that she met that she was a pureblood. When Dolores got older, her appearance began to make her look like a large pale toad. She was squat with a broad, flabby face, had little neck showing, and had a very slack mouth. When she turned 11, she went to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and was sorted into Slytherin House. She did not enjoy her time at school and felt as though she was overlooked for all positions of responsibility such as being prefect or head girl. Her head of house was Horace Slughorn who disliked her as a child and as an adult. He considered her to be an idiotic woman. She was disliked by almost all students including Severus Snape, a fellow Slytherin. While at Hogwarts, she became an accomplished witch, and directly after finishing school, she joined the Ministry of Magic. She started with a very small job as an intern in the improper use of magic office. Even at 17, Dolores was judgmental, prejudiced, and sadistic. Between coming off as being very sweet and very hardworking to her superiors, and being ruthless and stealthy to take credit for other people's work, she worked her way up very fast. Before she was 30, Dolores had been promoted to head of the office. Once she got to that level, it was a short step to get positioned in the management of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, one of the biggest divisions in the entire ministry. Umbridge never walked into work. She always used the flu network because she thought she was too important to ever walk like lower level ministry workers like her father. By this time, she had persuaded her father to take an early retirement and by making him a small financial allowance, she ensured that he dropped quietly out of sight. She was still ashamed of him and whenever she was asked by workmates who did not like her if she was related to the Umbridge that used to mop the floors, she would smile her sweetest laugh and deny any connection whatsoever, claiming that her deceased father had been a distinguished member of the Wizengamot. Nasty things tended to happen to people who asked about her father or anything else that Dolores did not like talking about. Anyone that wanted to stay on her good side pretended to believe her version of her ancestry. Dolores was desperate to marry someone with a lot of power, preferably one of her superiors. She never really cared which one of them it was. All that she wanted was for her status and security to be advanced with the help of a powerful husband. Unfortunately for her, in spite of her best efforts, she never succeeded in marrying anyone. While her superiors valued her hard work and ambition, those who got to know her best found it very difficult to like her. After a glass of sweet sherry, an intoxicated Umbridge would speak of very uncharitable views, and even those who were anti-Muggle found themselves shocked by some of her suggestions. She had ruthless ideas for the treatment of the non-magical that made the hairs on even the most anti-Muggle employees stick up. Her hate for Muggles most likely appeared due to her extreme dislike for her mother. She also had a strong disliking for half-breeds, had a tendency to have to be in control, and enjoyed humiliating others. Rowling has compared her to Bellatrix, saying that even though they were on different sides, they had many of the same beliefs and torture tendencies both mentally and physically. As she grew older and rose higher in the ministry, Dolores' taste in little girl's accessories grew more and more pronounced. Her office became a place of frills and furbelows, and she liked anything decorated with kittens. The summer before Harry's fifth year, the ministry had turned on Harry and Dumbledore, who claimed that Voldemort had returned. The ministry said that they were liars, and said that none of what they were saying was true. They printed story after story 
story, making Harry and Dumbledore look awful, and in the eyes of most wizards and witches, they were disliked and not to be trusted. This, however, did not satisfy Umbridge's lust for bringing displeasure to those that went against her. The most that would have been enough, but Umbridge took it to a whole nother level. She sent the mentors to attack Harry at the Dursleys. The plan was quite brilliant. It would force Harry to use magic to stop them, and no muggles would see the creatures because the mentors were invisible to them. The oblivious minister of magic, Cornelius Fudge, had no idea what she had done. He was not the brightest, and had begun to get anxious and paranoid that Albus Dumbledore had plans to take his place as minister. Umbridge managed to claw her way to the very heart of power. She used both Fudge's pride and fears against him, and made him think that she was one of the few people that he could trust. He ended up making her senior undersecretary to the minister himself. Umbridge's plan of sending the mentors to make Harry use magic outside of school worked, and she was part of the trial that he had to face for breaking the international statute of secrecy. During the trial, it was clear that Fudge had no idea what the lawyers had done, and it was clear that he was being manipulated by her. Dumbledore was there to defend Harry, and pointed out the fact that the Dementors were sent by the Ministry, a fact that was of course spot on. This made Umbridge speak up and say, I'm sure I must have misunderstood you, Professor. It's so silly of me, but it sounded for a moment as though you were suggesting that the Ministry had ordered the attack on this boy. She finished by laughing, and a few laughed with her, but it could not have been plainer that not one of them was really amused, they just feared Umbridge. Umbridge was not happy when Harry was cleared of all charges, as her plan had come so close to being successful. Getting close to Fudge, however, gave her another opportunity, not only to take down Harry Potter, but Albus Dumbledore as well, when Fudge appointed her as the Inquisitor at Hogwarts. She had not enjoyed her time at school, where she felt that she had been overlooked for all positions of responsibility, and now, she relished the chance to return to wield power over those she felt had not given her her due. Not only was she the Inquisitor, but she was also the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor appointed by Fudge himself. The first night students arrived, Dumbledore introduced her, but when he moved on, he was interrupted by Umbridge, something that took him, the staff, and many of the students aback. Dumbledore was polite and let her speak, but the other members of the staff were not as welcoming. Sprout raised her eyebrows in a disliking way, and McGonagall's mouth was as thin as Harry had ever seen it before. She gave a speech and addressed the students as if they were five-year-olds. When she said that she and the students would be friends, many of the students laughed at her. When she began talking about how the school was run and how it needed to be changed, McGonagall looked at her like an angry hawk. Umbridge taught defense against the dark arts with no wands and no magic being used to the disappointment of pretty much every student in the school. She just had the kids read chapters that were ministry approved. During her first lesson with the Gryffindors, Umbridge criticized past defense against the dark arts teachers and even called Lupin a dangerous half-breed, which a few shocked students protested. Harry eventually interjected and he and Umbridge went at it. And how's theory supposed to prepare us for what's out there? There is nothing out there, dear. Who do you imagine wants to attack children like yourself? Oh, I don't know, maybe Lord Voldemort? Umbridge told the class that Harry was a liar, told Harry that Cedric Diggory's death was an accident, and gave him detention every night for the next week. When Harry went to her detention, Umbridge told him that he was there for spreading evil, nasty, attention-seeking stories about Voldemort returning. She then gave Harry a special quill and told him to write, I must not tell lies, for as long as it took for the message to sink in. The quill she gave him did not require any ink, because it wrote in Harry's blood. As he wrote the words, they appeared on the back of Harry's hand. As Harry looked up at her, Umbridge was staring at him with a wide smile on her face. She made Harry do this into the night and watched him for signs of weakness, but he never showed any. The next day's detention was just as bad. The more he wrote with that quill, the slower the cut healed itself. During his detention at the end of the week, the scar did not fade from the back of Harry's hand, but remained scratched there, oozing droplets of blood. Seeing that the scar was permanent, Umbridge said that that ought to be a reminder that he would not forget anytime soon. Umbridge was the only person other than Lord Voldemort to leave a permanent physical scar on Harry. He would forever have, I must not tell lies, inscribed on the back of his hand. Fudge eventually promoted Umbridge to be the first ever High Inquisitor, giving her far more control at the school. This position meant that she could evaluate, harass, and fire any teachers at Hogwarts that she deemed unsatisfactory by her and the Ministry. She was extremely rude to many of the teachers that she evaluated, especially those with close ties to Dumbledore. Could you please predict something for me? I'm sorry? Well, sure you're not surprised, I ask. You would have foreseen it. During one of Umbridge's Defense Against the Dark Arts classes, she said that all of the previous Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, with the exception of Quirrell, would not have passed the Ministry's approval. Harry interjected, saying sarcastically that Quirrell was a great professor, with the exception that he had Lord Voldemort sticking out of the back of his head. This got him another week's worth of detention, making the scar on the back of his hand even deeper. 
When Umbridge was there to evaluate McGonagall's class, McGonagall ignored her. When Umbridge kept clearing her throat, McGonagall snapped at Umbridge, asking what she wanted. Umbridge asked her if she received her note, telling her the date and time of her inspection. But before she could finish, McGonagall cut her off, saying that of course she had gotten it, or she would have asked what she was doing in her classroom. When Umbridge interrupted her again, McGonagall asked how she expected to get an idea of her usual teaching methods if she continued to interrupt her. She then said, You see, I do not generally permit people to talk when I am talking. Harry, Ron, and Hermione eventually became fed up with Umbridge and her pointless defense against the dark arts classes. They knew that all of the students needed to be prepared for what was out in the real world and decided to start a group where Harry taught defensive magic to students who signed up and they called it Dumbledore's Army. According to the rule book, this was allowed and there was nothing that Umbridge could do about it. Umbridge ended up finding out about it through an informant named Willie Wittershins. He was at the bar when they formed the club, and in return for his information, Umbridge ensured that he would not be prosecuted for crimes he had committed. After getting this news, Umbridge worked with Fudge to make a decree banning all organizations, societies, teams, groups, and clubs until they got permission from Umbridge herself to continue it or to start a new one. This of course forced Dumbledore's army to meet in secret as they knew that she would never accept it. Umbridge also used this decree to threaten the entire Gryffindor Quidditch team just to get to Harry. She immediately allowed Slytherin to go on, but she told Gryffindor that she needed time to think about it, relishing in the fact that she could hold this over Harry's head. She did not accept them for a month and McGonagall had to step in and get Dumbledore involved to make Umbridge accept them. Umbridge had been intercepting mail before it left the castle, specifically Harry's mail. She intercepted Hedwig, ruffling her feathers and breaking one of her wings. One of the letters that she got from Hedwig informed her of the time and place that Harry would chat with Sirius. The night that Harry, Ron, and Hermione were talking to Sirius through the fire, Umbridge caught them. Her hand appeared amongst the flames, reaching for Sirius. The three ran, and Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Sirius were not caught, but Umbridge was very close to catching an infamous escaped convict. After Harry and George had attacked Malfoy with their bare hands on the Quidditch pitch, McGonagall took them to her office. While disciplining them, blood rushed to McGonagall's face as Umbridge interrupted, asking if she could help. McGonagall rejected her and gave Harry and George a week's worth of detention, but Umbridge spoke up, saying that they deserved more of a punishment than just detentions. McGonagall said that it was her decision, as she was the head of their house, but Umbridge pulled out another decree that stated that she had power to have authority over all punishments the teachers make. She explained to McGonagall that she had given her the idea after she went over Umbridge's head to allow Gryffindor to play again. Umbridge altered the punishment, banning Harry and George from playing Quidditch ever again, and her smile widened as she watched Harry's reaction to this news. The day that Hagrid returned from his mission to recruit giants for Dumbledore, Umbridge went to his hut to question him on where he had been. On her way there, she noticed three sets of footprints leading to his cabin and looked all around it trying to figure out whose they were. Luckily, she never found Harry, Ron, and Hermione who were under the invisibility cloak in the corner of his hut. She knew that Hagrid was a half-breed giant according to Rita Skeeter's article written the previous year, and her disgust of half-breeds made her immediately dislike Hagrid, something that was even more pronounced when she found out how close he was to Dumbledore. She later evaluated his class, and he did not do well in the eyes of Umbridge. She talked to him as if he was a stupid child who did not understand English, all because he was a half-breed. Umbridge even laughed along with Draco and other Slytherins when they made fun of him. Umbridge and Fudge had another decree come in, saying that teachers were banned from giving students information that was not strictly related to the subjects that they taught. Lee Jordan found a loophole in this, saying that she was not allowed to tell Fred and George off for playing Exploding Snap as it had nothing to do with Defense Against the Dark Arts. Later that year, Harry did a story with Rita Skeeter about what really happened the night that Voldemort returned. When Harry got loads of letters from people that had read it, Umbridge went over to him and asked what was going on. When Harry handed her the article, she was filled with rage. She said that she had told him time and time again not to tell lies, but the message was not sinking in. She took 50 points from Gryffindor and gave Harry another week's worth of detention. She then banned the magazine with the article in it, but this backfired, and in banning it, she ensured that every person in the school read Harry's interview. Umbridge later humiliated and fired Professor Trelawney in front of the whole school. Oh God, is my home. I can't do this. Actually, I can. She tried to kick her off the premises as well, but Dumbledore stepped in and put a stop to that. You have the right to dismiss my teachers. You do not have, have the authority to banish them from the grounds. Umbridge was furious and asked what Dumbledore would do when she hired a new divination teacher. Dumbledore laughed in her face and said that that would not be necessary, as he had already found a replacement. Umbridge was utterly outraged when she found out that the replacement was Ferenzi, who was a centaur, or as Umbridge saw him, a half-breed.
Umbridge got some good news, however, when a member of Dumbledore's army, Marietta Edgecombe, ratted the club out, going directly to Umbridge. When Umbridge and a select group of Slytherins went to the Room of Requirement, they had to chase after the fleeing DA members. Umbridge was delighted and gave 50 points to Slytherin when Draco caught Harry. Umbridge dragged Harry to the headmaster's office, where Fudge and Umbridge pressed him about the secret club. Dumbledore sat calmly behind his desk as they did so. When Harry refused to talk, Umbridge brought in Marietta. When she asked Marietta about the club, she was shocked when she disagreed with everything that she said, now saying that there was not a meeting and that Harry was not the leader. This was because Kingsley, an order member, modified her memory on the spot without anyone seeing. Umbridge got mad and seized Marietta, pulled her around to face her, and began shaking her very hard. This made Dumbledore get to his feet, his wand raised, ready to protect his student. Kingsley then stepped forward, and Umbridge leapt back from Marietta. Kingsley told her to calm down and said that she did not want to get herself into trouble. This was a look into the real Umbridge. The Umbridge that did not care about Marietta or the rules, but cared about power. When she realized that if she did not calm down, she would lose all of the power that she had, she immediately stopped. Not for the sake of Marietta, but because she wanted to stay on top. When they moved on, Umbridge had other evidence of the club's existence with the list of names entitled Dumbledore's Army. This was enough to arrest Dumbledore, and as they were doing so, Dumbledore knocked them all out except for Harry, McGonagall, and Marietta. He then escaped without any of them even knowing that they were knocked out. With Dumbledore gone, Umbridge replaced him as headmistress. Everyone at Hogwarts, however, did not make her new appointment easy. She tried to get back into Dumbledore's office that night to claim it as her own, but the gargoyles refused to open for her. She formed her inquisitorial squad, which included Draco and a few other Slytherins that she handpicked, and they helped her keep an eye on those who were likely to rebel. She also got Filch on her side, and he was far more loyal to her than he had ever been to Dumbledore, because she let him do much more with punishment. Umbridge later tried to get Harry to tell her secrets by giving him tea with true serum in it. Not knowing that Snape had given her fake serum to protect the order, she asked Harry about the whereabouts of Dumbledore and Sirius Black. When he said that he did not know about either, she brought up the fact that she had almost caught him and Sirius in the fire. She then said that if she had any proof that it was them, she promised that neither of them would be at large right now. Just then, a loud bang shook the whole castle, courtesy of Fred and George. When Umbridge went down, she found chaos, as enchanted fireworks shaped like dragons went up and down the corridors. On top of that, there were loads of other whizzing rockets and sparks ricocheting off the walls. Sparklers were writing swear words in midair of their own accord, firecrackers were exploding like mines, and instead of burning themselves out, they seemed to be gaining in energy and momentum. Umbridge and Filch stood there, transfixed with horror. The fireworks continued to burn and spread all over the school, and though they caused plenty of disruption, the other teachers did not seem to mind them very much. When one of the dragons went into McGonagall's classroom, she did not fix it, and instead had Umbridge come and deal with it. Umbridge's first day as headmistress was spent running around the school, answering the summons of the other teachers, none of whom seemed able to rid their rooms of the fireworks without her. After helping Flitwick, he thanked her, and he said that he could have gotten rid of it on his own, but he wasn't sure if he had the right authority. Umbridge sat in on Harry's career appointment with McGonagall, and Harry told McGonagall that he wanted to be an Auror. As she was explaining what classes he would have to take, Umbridge repeatedly cleared her throat, trying to step in, and after about the third time she did this, McGonagall turned to her and asked if she wanted a cough drop. When Minerva continued, she said that his defense against the Dark Arts scores were very high, but Umbridge jumped in to say that she had not taken Harry's most recent defense against the Dark Arts grades into account, as he was not doing well in her class. McGonagall altered what she had originally said to Harry, saying that he had achieved top marks in all defense against the Dark Arts classes that were set by a competent teacher. Umbridge's fake smile vanished immediately, and she was furious. She said that Harry had no chance of being an Auror, and McGonagall said to Harry that she would assist him to become an Auror if it was the last thing that she did. Umbridge said that Fudge would never allow it, and Minerva said that there would be a new Minister of Magic by the time Harry's graduation came. Umbridge then freaked out, accusing Minerva of helping Dumbledore plot against Fudge. Minerva calmly said that she was raving, and told Harry that their meeting was over. When Harry left, Umbridge and McGonagall continued continued to shout at each other. Later that day, Umbridge caught Fred and George after turning the corridor into a swamp. Umbridge told Filch that he could punish them with a whip. Before he could, however, Fred and George called their brooms to them, and as the Inquisitorial squad moved in on them, they kicked off the ground, shooting into the air. Before they left, they told Peeves the Poltergeist to give Umbridge hell for them. To the fury of Umbridge and Filch, they flew away from the school, never to return as students again. Although Flitwick and McGonagall probably could have removed the swamp pretty easily, they let Umbridge and Filch try to figure it out, and they had no luck. 
People also followed in Fred and George's footsteps by slipping a Niffler into Umbridge's office, which tore the place apart. Dung bombs and stink pellets were dropped very frequently in the corridors, and odd things kept happening to Umbridge's inquisitorial squad, and many of them ended up in the hospital wing. Before Fred and George left, they had sold many things, including things that got kids sick to get out of class. Umbridge started shrieking with rage and frustration as she attempted to trace the mysterious symptoms to their source, but the students stubbornly told her that they were suffering from Umbridge-itis. The thing that gave her the most trouble, however, was Peeves, who took Fred and George's words to give her hell to heart. He upended tables, burst out of blackboards, toppled over statues and vases. Twice he shut Mrs. Norris, Filch's cat, inside suits of armor. He smashed lanterns, juggled burning torches over the heads of screaming students, flooded the second floor, released a bag of tarantulas into the Great Hall during breakfast, and spent hours floating behind Umbridge, relentlessly annoying and throwing things at her. None of the staff besides Filch did anything to help her either. McGonagall even saw Peeves Peeves unscrewing a chandelier and told him that it unscrewed the other way. One night, Umbridge got a few wizards and witches to come with her to Hagrid's hut to fire him, and when he ran for it, she ordered them to attack him. When McGonagall came out to defend Hagrid, Umbridge ordered them to stop her, and she was hit with four stunning spells at the same time straight in her chest, badly injuring her, something that satisfied Umbridge. Umbridge later caught Harry using her flu network, and she and her inquisitorial squad also caught Hermione, Ron, Ginny, Neville, and Luna, who were also helping him. When Harry refused to tell her what he was doing, she planned to use truth-telling serum, but Snape told her that they were all out. Umbridge became desperate, and her evil side came out. She planned to use the illegal Cruciatus Curse, or the Torture Curse, which she thought would loosen Harry's tongue. The Cruciatus Curse ought to loosen your tongue. That's illegal. But Cornelius doesn't know, won't hurt him. Hermione tricked Umbridge into following her and Harry into the Forbidden Forest in search of an alleged weapon that Hermione made up so that she would not torture Harry. When they got in the forest, they were confronted by centaurs, and Umbridge called them half-breeds, a racial slur, and said that they had near-human intelligence, something that greatly offended them. They shot an arrow at her that was so close to her it clipped her hair. They all laughed at her, which infuriated Umbridge. <laughs> Umbridge had made a huge mistake and was taken by the centaurs. They kept her bound and helpless and planned to kill her eventually. Dumbledore had to go into the forest to rescue her. When they returned, Dumbledore brought Umbridge to the hospital wing. While there, she was in shock and spent most of her time lying in bed staring at the ceiling. When Ron was in the hospital wing, he made clip-plopping noises and she sat bolt upright terrified. But when Madame Pomfrey asked her what was wrong, she said that she must have been dreaming. Umbridge left Hogwarts the day before the end of term. She tried to sneak out during dinner to make a quiet getaway, but unfortunately for her, she met Peeves on the way out and he chased her gleefully from the premises, whacking her with a walking stick. Harry later realized that the walking stick that Peeves was using was Professor McGonagall's after her injury. McGonagall sat back and smiled as Peeves chased her off. After it was revealed that Harry and Dumbledore were telling the truth about Voldemort's return, Fudge was forced to resign and Rufus Scrimger became the new Minister of Magic. Umbridge was able to slip back into her former position, and the Ministry and Scrimger had more immediate problems than Dolores Umbridge. The new Minister would later be punished for this oversight, however, when he tried to get Harry on the Ministry side. Because he did not punish Umbridge for the many awful and illegal things that she did at Hogwarts, and the fact that he still allowed her to be employed at the Ministry, Harry felt that this showed the Ministry's essential corruption, and he refused to work with the new minister. Umbridge gave Scrimger the information that Harry wanted to be an Auror, something that Scrimger tried to use to entice Harry to work with them, but the very mention of Umbridge turned Harry off to the idea even more. He then showed Scrimger the scar on the back of his hand, courtesy of Umbridge, and said that he had not forgotten the awful things that she had done to him. Umbridge attended Dumbledore's funeral with a look of unconvincing grief. When she saw the centaur Firenze, she gave a start and ran into a seat a good distance away from the centaur. Later on during the funeral, Hagrid blew his nose, which was so loud it sounded like trumpets, and Umbridge, who despised half-breeds, looked at him in a disliking way. Very soon after that, Umbridge began enjoying her life at the Ministry more than ever. When the Ministry was taken over by Voldemort and his puppet, Minister Pius Thickness, the Ministry was infiltrated by Voldemort's followers. Umbridge was now in a true element at last. Voldemort had her judged by senior Death Eaters, and they realized that she had many of the same evil aspirations that they had. They put her back in her old post, but this time with extra authority, becoming the head of the Muggleborn Registration Commission. This new division of the Ministry imprisoned innocent Muggleborns on the basis that they had stolen their wands and magic from the real witches and wizards. She put many Muggleborns in Azkaban without a second thought. 
After Order member Mad-Eye Moody's dead body had been secured by the Death Eaters after the Battle of the Seven Potters, she took his magical eye and put it on her office door. She tortured the Ministry employees with the mere concept that she could observe their every move with that eye. One day, when she was in Diagon Alley, she came across Mundungus Fletcher, who was illegally selling stolen items. She asked if he had a license, and when she realized that he did not, she was going to find him. However, she saw a locket that he had, which she really liked, and she said that if he gave her the locket, she would let him go. Little did she know that that was the locket locket of Salazar Slytherin, and also one of Voldemort Torcroxes. Not knowing this, she told everyone that the S on it stood for the Selwyn family, a pureblood family known to be dark wizards and even death eaters, and she told anyone that asked about the locket that she was related to them. She said this, hoping that it would bolster her pureblood status credentials, something that she desperately needed, because the truth was, she was not a pureblood at all. The Horcrux inside the locket affected most people in a negative way, making them angry and irrational. When Umbridge had it, however, because she was so evil already, the Horcrux did not affect her like it affected others, but rather, it made her stronger. During one of Umbridge's blood purity hearings, she was tricked into thinking that Hermione and Harry were Mafalda Hopkirk and Runcor, Ministry employees. With their disguises, they easily got into the hearing room, and Harry stupefied Umbridge, knocking her out. They took the locket, and Hermione replaced it with a copy of the real one so that she would not know it was gone. Umbridge never knew that the locket was taken from her, and she continued to lock up Muggleborns leading into the Battle of Hogwarts. In that battle, Voldemort fell, and the Ministry was put back to normal. Kingsley Shacklebolt was the new Minister of Magic, and he put Umbridge on trial for working with Voldemort and his Death Eaters. She was convicted of torture, imprisonment, and the death of several Muggleborns that she put on trial. Some of the innocent Muggleborns that she had sentenced did not survive their ordeal in Azkaban. Umbridge was truly an awful person who had no conscience, no understanding of right versus wrong, and was obsessed with gaining more power and status. She lied, threatened, tortured, and did whatever it took to get to the top. She spent the rest of her life in Azkaban, and Lord knows she deserved it. Thanks so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media, links for that will be in the description. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be listed on my next video, plus a bunch of other rewards, check out my Patreon which is linked down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great videos on the way.